Okay, into the second subtopic in the final topic for stage two physics, light and atoms, and that is wave particle duality. And we're going to look at wave particle duality over three episodes, if you like. Um, in this first episode, we're going to look at photons. Then in the second one, we're going to look at x-rays. And then in the third one, we're going to look at the wave behavior of particles. Now, if you haven't already, I strongly encourage, in fact, I insist that you make sure you go look up, watch this TED-Ed video, is light a particle or a wave? And um, it just gives a really good background to the context to the sort of stuff that we're going to talk about in this video. So have a look at that if you haven't already, and then let's get into the rest of this. Cheers. So as you may have gathered by now, light doesn't, well, we can't describe the properties of light always as describing it as a wave, like we did in the previous subtopic um, where we looked at the wave behavior of light. Things like interference patterns that we talked about in the last subtopic can be explained by the wave nature of the light, but not all properties of light can be explained by the wave, um, by the wave model of light. And that's what we're gonna explore more in this video. So, what we often see is that in interacting with matter, light behaves like particles called photons with energy given by E equals HF. Um, so E is the energy, F is the frequency, and H is Planck's constant, um, which I've got down here. And um, later on, you guys are gonna have a go at determining this in a practical. And momentum given by P is the symbol we use for momentum, equals H divided by lambda, which is the wavelength of light. So what is the evidence that light behaves like a small particle? We already touched a little bit on this earlier. I've just excerpted this from the video on conservation of momentum and solar sails. And probably said in that video, we'll talk more about photons later in the year, and we're up until that point now. So we already talked a little bit about the idea of these photons hitting a solar sail, giving it momentum, using that to accelerate a spacecraft. But there's some other evidence that we want to discuss. The first of that is this little diagram here. And let's just read and explain what's going on here. Consider an image being created on photographic film or in a double slit experiment. And this is like the double slit experiment that we did with the interference of light in the last subtopic. If the light was a very low intensity, we might to expect to see the image state start off very faintly, but even, and over time become more intense as more light strikes the film. So just we would see this gradual appearance um, a gradual fading in, if you like, of the image. However, what happens is the image builds up as a series of discrete dots successively appearing over time. This indicates light is not reaching the film as a continuous wave, but in discrete individual bits, almost equivalent to individual particles of light hitting the film. So what we're not seeing, that gradual fading in, which would fit with the wave model of light, what we actually see if we use really low intensity light striking a film is initially it'll just look like a few dots and we'll just start to think we see a pattern in those dots and then eventually that pattern will become more discreet and it will look just like what we saw with the laser through the double slit where we have bands of constructive and destructive interference therefore bands of high intensity and low intensity but it just doesn't gradually appear it appears in dots like individual particles are hitting the film. And those particles are the photons, which is the, the topic of this subtopic. So that's, that's the first part of the evidence that, that really suggests that um, light is behaving like a particle or a photon. Um, and in the next slide, we are gonna f um, talk about some probably even more compelling evidence and it's one that we'll be able to explore in the laboratory. So we're going to talk now about the photoelectric effect um, and the photoelectric experiment. This is an experiment you guys will do in the lab. It's also an experiment that was completed by a scientist who you may have heard of called Einstein. And it was the experiment that really conclusively, um, conclusively sh demonstrated that light was behaving 
like a particle, i.e. a photon, as well as behaving like a wave. Didn't say the wave model was wrong, it just said it can do both things at the same time. Just before we, we get into that, because I think it will help explain this, I want to do a little thought experiment here. I want to think about you, and you're going to throw a ball at a wall. And let's say it's a reasonably soft wall, maybe it's a sheet of glass or something. And initially, when you throw that ball, if well, so if you throw that ball softly at the wall, so you have a low initial energy, then that ball, just draw my eye a bit clearer there, for the, that ball will probably just hit the wall and it will bounce back off. It won't penetrate through the wall. It won't break through the wall. However, if you throw it with a, that ball harder, with a higher initial energy, it will be able to break through that wall and then it'll keep traveling through on the other side of the wall. So if you don't want to think of a ball, maybe you could think of shooting a bullet through something or as well, but I think Keep it simple, just a ball. You've thrown it hard enough that it's, say, gone through a window. Now, hopefully, it seems sensible to expect that the final energy that this ball would have if it breaks through the wall will be equal to the initial energy of the ball minus the amount of energy it takes to break through the wall or break the piece of glass, whatever we're going through. So basically, the final energy will be the energy it, you threw it with initially, sorry my voice is going a bit funny, minus the energy that it took to break the wall and to get through it. It's obviously going to lose some energy as it goes through the wall in breaking that. So hopefully that sort of picture makes sense. And obviously if you don't throw the ball with enough energy, it won't be able to break through the glass. So you won't be able to measure the energy on this side of the wall if it doesn't go through the wall. Basically um, we won't worry about you know, what energy it bounces back here, but the energy on this side, well, it can't exist if it doesn't have enough energy to break through that wall or that piece of glass. So I want you to just sort of keep that little throwing something at a wall or a piece of glass in your mind as we go through what's happening in the photoelectric experiment. So what does it say? When light of sufficiently high frequency is incident on matter, it may be absorbed by the matter from which electrons are then emitted. This is called the photoelectric effect. So here, and this is a simulation here that you can go to on FET. I've got a feeling it's a Java one, so you might need Java to run to make it work. Um, but I'll try and demonstrate it in class if you do have a problem accessing it. And this is a simplified version of what the photoelectric apparatus looks like. We have a light and it shines onto a photoelectric cell. And this light basically shines onto a metallic plate here. And we can change the frequency of this light. So we can go from, if we just think about visible light, the red end, which is the lower energy, the lower frequency, or the uh, longer wavelength, but let's just worry about frequency here through to that high energy, high frequency end up at the violet into the ultraviolet light. And we shine this light onto the metal. And what will happen is if the light has enough energy to knock an electron out of a metal atom in this plate, that electron will come into this space here, where we've got a vacuum, and the electron will then um, basically flow across to this collector plate here, and then from this collector plate, that electron can then flow through a circuit like such. So we need a vacuum in here because if there was other particles in here, the electrons would strike those particles and lose energy. Um, and if this light doesn't have enough energy, then it won't knock an electron out. It'll be like this case here where it basically just goes in. It doesn't have an enough energy to break something out so it just basically bounces back off again without causing any change in the metal i.e any electron to be released that can get pushed come across here and start a flow of electricity so what we would start here in the photoelectric experiment is initially we would start maybe shining light here at the low frequency 
low energy. Remember, E equals HF, so that the energy is proportional to the frequency. Um, and we would see no current flow. Initially, no current would flow. And then, if we started to increase the frequency, so move this way along the spectrum, increase the energy, increase the frequency, at some point, we will see current start to flow in the photoelectric cell, and then that current will basically just um, keep flowing um, after that point. Once the light has got enough energy, it'll cause the, um, the current to flow. And we can just measure that by measuring the current flowing in this circuit. Um, and we'll do this in the lab. However, it's not just the current here we're interested in. We're interested in how much energy these electrons have that flow through the circuit. You know, what is the final energy of these electrons in the circuit? In a similar way that we talked about what's the final energy of this ball after it broke through the wall. And the way that we do that, and again, we'll do this in the lab, is we apply a reverse potential difference. So these electrons are gonna come through this circuit, they're gonna have a certain amount of energy we are gonna apply a voltage here with a, a power supply, but we're gonna apply it in the opposite direction. So that voltage is basically gonna be trying to push the electrons back that way. And when that voltage, that reverse voltage here, is equal to um, the maximum amount of energy an electron has, it will stop all of those, um, it'll stop all of those electrons. So we call that voltage that we need to stop all the electrons, the stopping voltage. And that stopping voltage is basically um, tells us what the maximum amount of energy the electrons have. So I've just added these signs here. You can think of this as like the negative end of the photo cell because we're getting electrons released at this end. So we've got negative electrons. We're losing electrons from this end. So when we lose electrons, that would be positive. So we would expect the electrons to flow through the circuit like that. Where we have this reverse potential difference that provides our stopping voltage, we basically have the negative end of that here, the positive, and when the voltage there is equal to the maximum, basically think your negatives here are gonna repel each other. It's gonna basically start to push back on those electrons that are flying around. And when it has enough energy, it'll push back enough energy to stop all the electrons flowing. So that is the photoelectric cell and a brief summary of the photoelectric experiment. As I said, we will do that in the lab to make that make, so it hopefully makes some more sense. Now, one really important observation with this experiment was that the intensity of the incident light affects the number, but not the energy of the emitted electrons. So if you keep the frequency the same and the energy the same, and you just increase the intensity of this light, you will see the current increase, um, providing you've got obviously enough energy to, to cause an electron to be emitted. So you're above that, that energy that's critical to knock an electron out. If, if light was just behaving as a wave, you would expect as you increase the intensity of this light, you would provide more energy. So if there was more energy at some critical intensity, eventually that you would always get an electron um, knocked out and flow through the circuit. But if you are below the energy to knock an electron out, down in the low frequency, low energy end, doesn't matter how intense you make that light, you won't see an electron flow. So that that comparison of what happens with the intensity of the light versus the frequency and the energy of the light was that overwhelming evidence to support the fact that light well, was behaving as a photon, which was behaving more like a particle than a wave where we would have expected in increasingly intensity to increase the energy available and for an electron to be emitted regardless of the frequency or the energy of the light. So the minimum frequency F naught at which electrons are emitted varies from the type of material and is called the threshold frequency. Talk more about that in a sec. But basically 
that minimum energy will be different for different materials, different metals, um, and we call that the threshold frequency. The work function at the surf of a surface is the minimum energy required to remove an electron from it. So the, this relates to the threshold frequency because we know that energy equals H times F, so there's a, they're directly proportional to each other, but that energy to knock an electron out, it's like this energy to break the wall is referred to as the work function. Um, as I've sort of almost hinted before, the work function is related to the threshold frequency by W equals H F naught. And you'll see that in the diagram in a sec um, below when I talk about that. So that is the photoelectric effect experiment and the really um, crucial bit of evidence to support the fact that what light is behaving like a particle called a photon. Let's look at what the results of that experiment look like a little bit closer. Um, and you will be doing this, as I've said a couple of times now. If we draw, if we do this experiment and we slowly increase the frequency and, and we measure the maximum kinetic energy of the electrons, just know I've called it K max. In the book here, they call it E K max, but just having double super subscripts to me gets confusing. So. EK max is exactly the same as K max. It's the maximum kinetic energy of these electrons flowing through the circuit. So if we started doing that experiment, initially, let's just focus here on metal one in our photoelectric cell. Initially, when we did that, we would not see, um, you know, the kinetic, the, we wouldn't see any current flowing. So initially, if the frequency was too low, we would not see any electrons flowing. We would not see, um, yeah, we'd see no current. And then eventually we would reach a point here at the threshold frequency for metal one where we just see current starting to flow. And then as we kept increasing the frequency, if we measured the maximum kinetic energy of these electrons, we would see a linear line. And the slope of that linear line would be H. It would be given by Planck's constant um, because the relationship between the energy, which K max is a measure of energy, and frequency is given by E equals HF. That was on the previous slide. So, you know, if you use that linear equation type thing, um, that gives us that slope. Another way to think about that, maybe you might find useful, is what we're dealing with here is something you've probably dealt with in mass in previous years. We've got this line Y equals MX plus C. So that's a linear equation there. So in a sense, Y here is our K max. Our slope is equal to H. Our X value is equal to frequency. And then the um, constant which is the y-intercept. The y-intercept here is equal to the work function, but it's the, the negative of the work function. So we're going to say minus, not plus, minus the work function. So that, which is the equation I'm about to talk about, is the equation that describes the behaviour of, well, relation, the relationship between the, the maximum energy of the electrons and the frequency in the photoelectric experiment. So... I've sort of already written that there, but let's write that out again. We can say that K max is equal to H F minus the work function. Now, what we've just done there is deduce the formula K max equals H F minus work function. Um, Plot experimental values, I've shown you how to do that. Solve problems, which is basically um, just, yeah, doing stuff with linear equations. What I want to do here, I'm just trying to find the one, describe how Einstein used the concept of photons and the conservation energy to explain the experimental observations. Well, part of that is this idea of the that, 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 um, that threshold frequency or threshold energy to break through the wall. But another way that I like to think about this to really show this is conservation of energy 
is that basically what conservation of energy says to us is that the um, total initial energy should equal the total final energy. So if we think about this photoelectric experiment, what is the initial energy? Well, the initial energy is the energy given by the light, which is equal to HF. That's, if you like, the initial energy we threw the ball at the wall with. And the final energy is equal to the energy that it took to break through the wall, which is the work function, plus the energy the electrons had, which is K max. And you can see there, if you rearrange what I've just written there, so sorry, that's the final case. That is the total initial energy there. That is the total final energy there. And yeah, the total initial energy equals the total final energy. So we are obeying the law of conservation of energy. Therefore, because this relationship here is, well, sorry, this relationship here is derived directly from this relationship here. It's just a simple algebraic rearrangement. We can say that this relationship here for the photoelectric effect follows the law of conservation of energy. Um, just before I wrap up, one more thing I probably should note. If we look at different materials or normally different metals, the way they will vary is each atom will have different energy levels and each metal will have different energy levels of electrons within it. We'll look more at that when we look at the structure of atoms later on in this topic. Um, but we've talked about you know energy levels and or maybe not energy levels so much, but you might be familiar with that through uh, maybe chemistry and um, electron shells and all that and all those shells having different energy levels. So when we compare different metals, well, the slope will always be the same because this slope is given by Planck's constant, which is a constant, it doesn't change. But because different metals will have different energy levels within their electrons near the surface, they will have different work functions, therefore they will have different threshold frequencies. So if we compare different metals, we will basically see parallel lines because the slope will be the same but with different threshold frequencies. Okay, that's it for photons.